Beyond Survival is the official podcast of Waymaker Institute. Our desire is to equip you as a follower of Jesus to thrive. Each episode reveals how the gospel impacts the entire human experience for the advancement of God's kingdom. Ultimately, Jesus' promise of abundant life means we are meant to go beyond survival. So let's jump in with today's episode. Hey, uh, another episode of Beyond Survival. And this this is a, you know, I don't know. Some of the people that are going to listen to today's episode, they're not going to know this man. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be some people that do. And they'll be like, where do I know this guy, Kevin Mahan? He looks familiar. (laughs) And so we are really excited to have Kevin um, coming uh, live from, where are you at? Mannheim. Mannheim, Mannheim, Pennsylvania. You'd say I'm in Lancaster County, about an hour 30 from Philadelphia. Most people think we're just Amish. I am here to represent the non-Amish side of Lancaster <laughs> County. Yeah. Uh, how Did you drive a car to work today? I uh, I chose to, yes. yes. My buggy was getting worked on. Yeah. No, no there's, all, with all stereotypes aside, we, we are just outside of the state capital in Harrisburg okay. and Lancaster is actually uh, an incredibly cool town in the history of America. And so we have, um, and one of the longest standing markets. And so on the side of our market, our farmer's market, it says since 1732, you're kidding in existence. Yeah. Wow. So like the cobblestones of the Madison's and Washington's and all those are around here. What? Wow. And all that. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah, saw the Liberty Bell a couple weeks ago with my boys on Philly. Rocky oh, wow. steps. You do all the things when you're out in Philly, you know, cheesesteaks. Wow. Did you run up the steps? Yeah. Please say yes. No, I didn't get out of the car, man. I'm a dad. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I was like, drop off caravan. You guys go have the experience. I'll try not to get pulled over by the police. Either, you know? Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah. That's Plus, fine. as a Detroit guy, it's like, who cares? Who oh, cares? Mm-hmm. it's Philly. Mm-hmm. Careful. Yeah. Careful. Hey, hot take. Rocky is a terrible movie that if it took place anywhere besides Philadelphia, no one would care about that movie here. So. Sophia, I warned you. Didn't did I, I not? Yeah, you I, did. I warned you, you about did. Kevin. It's already so, happened. So here's the deal. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Kevin Mahan is actually my good friend. Uh, his family, That's right. uh, mm-hmm. his wife Rachel, and their three boys. They are dear friends. And not only that, but you actually uh, you care about our church because you you have a even you. A unique perspective and experience. So explain mm-hmm. for those of you maybe who are, you look familiar or maybe like, do I know him from the past? How do you know our church? Yeah. So I want to go back. I, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I like okay. to say the Kid Rock side of Detroit, not the Eminem side. <laughs> and so more like trailer park people. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> What's yeah. the difference? Oh. Well, Eight Mile versus like the trailer parks. Okay. So right. if you've seen the movie Eight Mile, you're like, oh, I get Kevin. Yes. I'm like, you don't get me. <laughs> uh, we are assembly line workers. Oh, and, uh, goodness. And that side of Detroit. Okay. But yeah, Detroit, nice. you know, all that. I, I wanted to get away from home, so I went to Liberty University. And I remember the day that I was down there in high school searching for the school. And I found this church that just rocked my perspective about how true you could be about Jesus. Mm. And so I was at the little white church out out on Brentwood Road, I believe. Mm. And, oh, wow. Um, I, first day looking at Liberty and me and my parents were there and I thought, if I come to school here, I'm going to that church. Wow. And so I started from day one as a student being plugged into this local church. That was Brentwood Church. And uh, my wife, Rachel, who I met later, was an intern at the church. She mm. actually lived next to the Dupins and was one of their babysitters. And oh, so- I did, I did not know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yep. And um, back in the Dupin complex in, uh, you know, Newtown Cryer, is that what it's called? Newtown. Newtown. Mm-hmm. Newtown. Yeah, yeah. She lived right next door. Okay. Yeah. Wow. yeah the, and listen. So there's a deep history oh. and love for both Brentwood, Waymaker, and the Dupins. Yeah. And that's just the pre conversation. Mm-hmm. So then. Yeah, I had this huge, cool opportunity. The first thing I, I say, I became an accidental pastor because I was asked to come on staff at Brentwood. <laughs> but I was a communication guy and the assimilation guy. And people start telling you stuff because you had a name tag and you're like, you should talk to a real pastor. <laughs> and so God like slowly moved m- me into this place of owning the role mm. and knowing, hey, I have something to offer here. And, mm. um, and so I got a chance to serve with you, Brett, uh, on staff. Mm-hmm. And I was, I think I was hosting regularly out at, at Forest when you yeah. were at ETR. Mm-hmm. And that was the last stint that I had there before moving to Lancaster County. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. man. Yeah. So it's so cool. And, uh, even just to be able to, 
to kind of follow your journey since you guys moved up to Pennsylvania and yeah, and great. the the more and more leadership that God has entrusted you. So currently, you are the campus pastor at the Mannheim campus, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm one of the thousands of people that have been sent out to do ministry across the globe from Waymaker. Yeah. And man, I, I carry that mantra with me proudly. There's actually a couple other on staff here too. Corey Hunter used to be a designer there. Yes. Waymaker, he's here now. Um, and so a couple people, uh, Pennsylvania is not that far from Virginia. Yeah. yeah. And so we got a couple people up in this area that have a deep affection for Waymaker. So our campus is the largest campus. It's the original okay. campus founded 35 years ago. And so... Mm-hmm. Uh, as a church, we're around 19, 20,000 people across uh, our state. We have 19 locations mm. in my campus. Uh, we're, I just looked this week, we were at about 7,650 people mm. on that call. They call Mannheim home. So, wow. It's a lot of fun, man. 35 staff. Like, it's crazy. My daily privilege is to wake up and thank God and how in the world are you going to use me today to yeah. do, do, do what you have in front of us. And so, man, yeah, we're grateful for, for here. That's wow. so cool. Which which I tell you is crazy too, because outside of our building, I can see 11 silos. So it is like cornfields and tobacco. <laughs> and like you look and you're like, where are these people? Do they walk out of the corn to come here? In this <laughs> and you don't, you're not really sure. So, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, it's crazy. man. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Hey, um, you, uh, how long have you and Rachel been married? We have been married 14 years. 14 years. Yep. We'll hit 15 next summer. Wow. Mm. And then you got three boys who are all giant, boys. giants. They, they are. So I'm six, three and a half. Uh, and Rachel's six foot. And uh, we do not make small children. No. Nope. And we don't hide easily in crowds. And so, yeah, three boys uh, about to turn 11, about to turn, uh, just turned nine and just turned six. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. It's fine. Yep. Fifth grader, kindergartner, third grader in the middle. Mm. So... So Kevin, let me just start off because the premise that of this podcast really is this idea that somewhere along the way, um, mm-hmm. we've almost, uh, as a at least in kind of the Western culture, we've come to this idea that, well, you know, we can we can believe and follow Jesus, but probably we're just going to barely survive, make it through this life, but we're going to go mm-hmm. to heaven one day, mm-hmm. and yet it seems very contrary to to what Jesus seem to both live and even promise um, to us. And so I think if we just want to start really macro, when you think about like survival mode in the faith, when you think about just, Mm -hmm. yeah, just being in that survival um, state, what do you see? Like, what, what is that? Like, what do you see? What do you picture? Yeah. It's a phenomenal question, honestly. Um, So survival, the idea of survival can be pretty heady. Yeah. And, and so I actually had a tangible moment where I remember feeling like I was deep in the throes of survival okay. and uh, I was like, Oh, this is, this is what this is. And, um, man, took a couple lessons from that, but we had a tragic incident last fall. We're mm-hmm. coming up on the one year anniversary here yeah. um, wow. where wow. some girls crashed in a bus incident coming home from fall retreat. And so there's actually 31 people on board and, mm-hmm. and, um, and plus a driver and the driver had a medical incident where he passed out and his foot hit the accelerator and accelerated off the highway Sheesh. and it went for several hundred feet into the woods and crashed in the woods. And, um, man, it was, it was tragic. It, um, they all survived, right. Mm-hmm. Which wow. we were not sure was going to happen in wow. the first seven, seven days of this incident. Wow. And, um, man, it, it was one of those moments where everything stopped, everything dropped and it was literally survival in life. But then the, the secondary response team like myself that were in the hospitals with these families every day, Mm -hmm. following up and doing all that. Um, I I remember there was this moment you asked about survival. There's, there's some literalness to that, but the metaphorical thing of survival, like we may not always be in physical danger. Um, Mm -hmm. man, I remember that Thursday. So this happened on Sunday and it was several days later that Thursday we sat around the table, a couple of us and said, okay, um, what's the plan for next week? And I remember my mind being so trapped in mm-hmm. Thursday okay. that Monday felt like an eternity away. Mm-hmm. And even Friday was like, I don't know what my plan is for tomorrow. Like mm-hmm. today I'm going up to the hospital for this half a day and then we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, and survival feels like that moment where I'm trapped in the immediacy of right now, wow. mm-hmm. as opposed to mm-hmm. having a distance to be able to look out some perspective a plan, some, some tactics. I think, I think for me, I'm really tactical and mm-hmm. how I lead myself to. And mm-hmm. when I think of survival, it's like, all oh, that's gone. And I'm just, I'm just here right now. Um, 
trying to survive. Yeah. So, so yeah. okay, but I think you make a great point because you went to this idea, you talked about survival mode out of its necessity, right? So there was an aspect of necessity mm -hmm. in that moment that you guys are working day to day. I, I totally forgot, that was a year ago. I remember talking with yep. you and just praying yep. Yep. Uh, for for those young people and d the miracle that it was that they, yep. they all survived. But <clears throat> what, how did you, so I think the danger though is when we do have those necessity moments of survival, but then they actually become the norm, sure. like moving yep. forward. Uh, how did you, how long did it take you to begin to shift out of that? And then what did you do specifically to help to where that didn't become the norm for you anymore? Yeah. So, so a year later, too, I should finish the story too. Like they're all thriving again. Mm -hmm. And come on, these 15 and 16 year olds are leading the way and how to um, give meaning to something that doesn't have to have meaning. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're, man, taking steps with Jesus. There's the majority of them are all going back to fall retreat again this year as a oh, milestone man. that wow. they're conquering the enemy in mm. light of their stories. And so it's really cool to see, like they moved out of it. We moved out of it. And so we've, we've been in this situation. Yeah. And so without staying there too long on just that one incident, cause I've, I felt survival in lots of different places in my life as well. Mm. Um, one of the coolest things that happened in that particular meeting that Thursday morning was somebody just asked us the question, what are you going to do next week? And there's, there's relationships to have that just break us out of the now into Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't I thought about that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've not put any ounce of energy towards thinking, what, where am I going? Yeah. What's the vision? What are we doing? And so that, in the most raw sense, having a somebody that says, maybe they don't know, the, they don't know what to do, but they have options, right? Mm -hmm. And he started role playing some options like, oh, you could do this. We could do this. It just got us thinking out of now into, into the, what's next. Mm -hmm. And that was the plan we needed to start going from planning one day out to planning three days out mm -hmm. <laughs> to then start planning, okay, what do we do at the week mark? Okay, now what do we do at the month and the year? And now mm -hmm. when you're out of survival in the daily day-to-day, -day, you you begin to put perspective of what you're experiencing right now in light of that bigger thing and mm -hmm. and not just stuck in the immediacy of feeling that. And so, but, I, but I felt that as a dad, as a pastor, I felt that yeah. <laughs> as a faith follower, like when there when there is no question asker, I tend mm. to go really inside and say, this is all that there is, what's mm. broken. Yeah. So, mm. Wow. Mm. That's so good. You know, I, I was just thinking, you're talking about asking questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so Sophia, her husband and I, we're in group together. And okay. some of the most powerful moments are, are asking questions. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then like watching God and his spirit work within mm. those. Mm -hmm. And then he starts to orchestrate and like literally last week, it was just mm -hmm. like, let's just ask a question. And then it just, all this stuff started to stir. Yeah. Have you seen that in, in your life, even beyond just group of just people asking you questions? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, you're talking about this, um, tragedy that your church went through mm -hmm. this season of hardship. Um, when things are going good, you don't really feel maybe this intense pressure to mm -hmm. have community, um, to have people that are maybe on the outside, like mm -hmm. coming in. Um, but when you walk through that shadow of death, um, mm -hmm. uncertainty, it does almost put this pressure on you to, be with people and you can choose to not, um, or you can choose to receive the people that God has put mm. in your life. And so I don't think, um, I would even be here in this place if it wasn't mm -hmm. for people on the outside like coming in like you earlier kind of made this joke that you became an accidental pastor. I feel like yep. Waymaker does that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who is making those calls, but I feel like, I mean, I, feel like I became accident. Like I was, this was not in my plans to be a part of this church in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like you mm -hmm. guys do that. You just make people accidental pastors, but that like comes through, people seeing maybe your struggles, what you're going mm -hmm. through and then calling you out. So I think that's really, yeah. really special. Yeah. 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 There's probably, I mean, what, what kind of pretty type of questions? Like there's probably certain questions that bring out that 
perspective of I'm, right. I'm just right here in front of me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I'm so futuristic. Mm. I, I think future all the time. Okay. Like, yeah. Where are we going? What's going to happen? But 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 probably Sophia. I don't know for you if you feel mm. this. There's probably some really good questions about like reflecting on where you've been too. Mm-hmm. And so you get in the season of your seat and you say, No, no, I've seen God working the whole time. So right. now I have a new. I'm not just trying to survive this busy season. I can see where He might be working yeah. and he's equipped me for this moment. Yeah. And so, so I don't want to just make it sound like it's only future oriented. That's probably a more personality thing, but how, what, what are the questions that get you out of the immediate stuck into the perspective? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, the question that we had been asking was what is currently challenging in your faith life? Mm-hmm. Um, which is it, on the surface might seem like such a simple question because if you are really busy, you're not even thinking about it. But then when yeah. somebody asks you and you sit down and now you have to actually look at your faith mm-hmm. and what is hindering it or what is causing it to struggle. I mean, for me, that opens up the floodgates and it's like, wow, I didn't realize yeah. this was there. So I think, I mean, for me being an emotional person, asking questions about what's going on with your heart yeah. and your soul yeah. How do you feel? really get me and why and why yeah. futuristic questions um can make me very anxious <laughs> but if the right person is asking those questions it can lead you to a place of peace rather than yeah. fear so it just points all back to do you have people in your life mm-hmm. that are asking you the right questions mm-hmm. the hard questions and i think I don't know. As you've been a father and being a church leader, yeah. how crucial would you say that is to have people asking you hard questions, right questions? So, man, I, I, I'm reflecting. I don't, I don't necessarily even think it's hard questions. I just okay. think it's like, hey, what are we going to do tomorrow? <laughs> like sometimes okay. it's just a question okay. that makes you reflect on what is challenging my faith. Oh, it's, mm. it's I'm just being lazy. Mm. Like, it's not a hard answer. <laughs> yeah. right, it's right. like, oh, I've I've let myself slide the last two days and just saying, oh, it's a busy day. And so therefore mm-hmm. I don't need God in my life today. Like mm-hmm. that's a stupid answer, Kevin. Come on, <laughs> get back on it tomorrow, right? <laughs> and so so yeah. I think honestly, the deeper questions were um don't don't help me get unstuck as much. Hey Kevin, how's okay. your emotions today and why are you feeling that? Mm. That's how much time do you have? Because I gotta work <laughs> a lot of layers before I get down <laughs> and access to those. Okay. Okay. But but uh, like, hey, what do you what are you celebrating right now? Like, what do you, it, it'll, it'll kickstart the, the treadmill Okay. that you start thinking about, yeah, yeah. what am I going to, what am I celebrating? Why, why am I celebrating that right now? And so, wow. so for me, it is community, but it's also, it's also other, um, probably what it's doing is it's unlocking. This is something I've learned with some of my own anxiety management is mm. moving from like, I'm stuck to mm. curious, mm. curiosity, laughter, creativity have are an incredible ingrained power in our lives that mm-hmm. get us out of the immediacy stuck of, of like, I don't like what I'm doing as a father. I feel like I'm going nowhere in my career. Like mm-hmm. all those questions that we all circle on are just like stuck cycle mm-hmm. or curiosity. And that's why I think the power of a question that's gentle mm-hmm. <laughs> instead of all the way to a mm-hmm. hundred for somebody like me mm-hmm. is probably more of a gift from somebody that just listens to wow. that response. That, uh, wow. That's a little convicting, I'll be honest, <laughs> because uh, yeah. my questions are usually um, like Very my go to, like if I got some guys in the room, yeah, yeah and yeah. which I've done literally, <laughs> yeah, uh, as I say, hey, uh, paint a picture of your family, your faith, and your profession in 10 years. Okay. What do you see? Right. Are what they coloring see? or are they like talking? <laughs> okay. Thanks. The seals more like like art Listen, therapy. Right yeah, here. sure. <laughs> Listen, first of all, you have you you are a creative person, so you understand what I'm saying. Okay, I'm not going to take that from you. Okay, I'll fill the gaps. Um, <laughs> and I say begin to describe that. What what do you see? Like what 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 descriptive words would you point to your faith and your family yeah. and your profession? Yeah. Okay, awesome. And it's like this really cool, exciting, like oh, cool. And then and then the next question I say is now what in you left unchecked would actually be a detriment to what you just saw, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's like I come out, you know, I'm like, Junkier. let's go, let's let's come out swinging. But, but that has its place. That's a great it does. question. Yeah, mm-hmm. because you know, and so this is not binary. Is like mine versus yours. This is like a a timeliness. When mm-hmm. I'm in survival, I'm not thinking about Good ten point. years from now. Right. Good point. And so in, mm-hmm. in light of this conversation, I need somebody at coffee or somebody in passing just to look at you and say, man, what's on your heart? Like, what's yeah. what's the heaviness? 
Yeah. And, and it could be something so silly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it's a stuck. Mm-hmm. And it even, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm responsible for thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Like it's not the heavy stuff that gets me down. Mm-hmm. Like it is the same old treads wow. that me has fought for. Yeah. That I still have to reclaim again in this moment. Um, you're only the son of a postman, right? You don't have the right education. You don't mm-hmm. have, and it's the same non-creative junk mm-hmm. that I've battled forever that you've battled forever. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's the gentle, it's the gentle move out of that rut, mm-hmm. you know? wow. but there's absolutely a place for the big questions yeah. And, yeah. and unsettling us because, um, you gotta get unsettled. But. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, you know, I, like, I want to ask you a personal question. You yeah, mentioned, go for it, man. you mentioned <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the go, go as deep as you want. I got my pencil. I've got my crayons here. I'm ready to go. <laughs> See this guy. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, okay. Serious question. How many um, years of prison did you serve for shooting your wife in the face with a BB gun? Yeah. That story has grown so far what? that uh, my wife has an elegant face with no BB marks on it. <laughs> I shot her in the leg when we were dating because I was showing off. Oh and it's still okay, just tell, <laughs> still me. tell the tell the story, man. I had this and tell this, it like, truthful the truth. BB the pellet truth. gun. Yeah, we were hanging out. Like I'm mad for this girl, and so what happens in my mind is I go back to like middle school boy, and you're showing off, and you're doing stuff that's just insane. There's like three or four things I've always been in the same mode when I've hurt her. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> One time I picked her up over my head and she kept going. And and I like, I went full suplex on her oh, accidentally. God. And she decided to land on her head, um, oh, which geez. I feel like she could have braced herself better. <laughs> Probably. Okay. But the BB gun was just one of those, like uh, there was something in the chamber and I uh, convinced her there's nothing there. No, there's nothing there. And, and like something rolled in the chamber out of nowhere. And when I pulled the trigger, she looked at me and was just like, how could you? How could you do that? You betrayed me. (laughs) Gosh, man, we were just talking about that small group this summer. Really? And I went through all those stories and it was a, it was, it was a good moment of like, man, I've not grown all that much. (laughs) 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 I'm still doing this stuff. Oh, Oh, that's so, that's just a classic though, right? It's like, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. So no, in all, in all seriousness, (laughs) um, you mentioned anxiety and, Is that, uh, that's a new thing that I guess you're putting language to? Yeah, it's probably a thing I hate putting language to. Yeah. Uh, so I, part of my, part of big part of my story is I got to play soccer growing up my whole life. Love the game of soccer. Still love the game of soccer. I'm too old to participate, but I can tell other people to participate. So I coach still at a local high school here in the area. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it has been a huge gift to me. So I got to play at Liberty and, I was, um, one of my, my best discoveries about my internal world and, and figuring out like, how do I order this thing that's kind of competing against my external world and, um, was in the area of, of soccer. Mm -hmm. Um, I, man, I hit this point. I'm going to say it's really, I wish I could think of the actual year. I remember having this moment of epiphany where, um, like my journey has always been, I went from leading zero groups at Waymaker to leading 250 groups my first day I got here. Mm-hmm. I went from leading zero staff to leading 17 staff my first managerial assignment. Um, and I've done these like massive jumps. You never leading a campus. Here's the 8,000 person one. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and and I, like the preparation in those moments that gets us to that next level is the is the internal work of self discovery. You would think it's the external work of developing new leadership skills. Come but on. It's yeah. it's so much the internal alignment with the external expectation. And so Mm. every, every step, and I've seen this pattern happen in other people around me when the internal character is not addressed first, you don't actually get the external opportunity. Mm. Um, and for me, it was in one of those jumps that I realized as a father of young kids that were no longer like, um, I couldn't just make them do what I want them to do, to be honest. Like I couldn't discipline them for forcefully into the right way, which, which you, there's, there's ways we do that in healthy, important ways to guide our kids. But then their attitude came to the point of like, well, they have a strict opinion about this now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not just a quick obedience. The same thing that was happening. I started managing people and I started becoming a coach at a local high school. And so these things all work together where I realized mentally that I, whenever I hit a problem before, 
I would just fight through it. I'm, I'm a fighter, man. Like I'm always in fight mode, ready to go. And uh, pushing through myself to a soccer obstacle worked. And I was rewarded for that year after year. Mm-hmm. Pushing other people as I push myself never worked. And it finally, <laughs> it finally all fell apart for me. And I was like, I don't have the right tactics. I, have, I am playing my life like I'm a player. I need to move to a level of a coach. Uh, I have to help ignite Rachel in my home um, to let her know I'm behind her. She can choose how to do it, mm-hmm. but I'm with you. Like I'm never not with you, but you get the choice. Like instead of here's the choice, let's push harder. We're doing this together and it become overbearing. So I became so overbearing in so much of my leadership, not realizing that was actually a reflection of the internal work that was disorganized in my life. Yeah. And it was all anxiety. Wow. So my triggers quickly became ex- external things turn inside I'm not comfortable with me. Now let me push you all harder. And Mm. man, that pattern broke hard. And, um, and that was the start of my like Mm self-awareness journey of like, okay, God, like help it, break it then break it all away. Let me undiscover what it is. Where's it come from? Let me keep going. So yeah, Mm -hmm. it's probably been like five, six years now where I'm like, I hate being that dude. Cause you you would say from the outside, you look at me and you're like, that guy is not anxious. Like he's confident. Like he's doing his thing. He's, he's running hard. Um, like things are working like family, like, Everything works. No one knows the, the internal misalignment. Mm. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, Been owning that, man. Trying to own that at a new level. But yeah. I hate the A word. I don't like the A word. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Sophie, you've mentioned like th- that you can relate to this because you've mm. mentioned in past mm. episodes of anxiety. So, yeah. um, what you ask him a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, she's like, he'll ask one back. I yeah. don't want to ask one. <laughs> no, I think. Well, I have a comment and then a question. First, yeah, please. I feel that what you just explained, I notice in a lot of athletes. Like, mm-hmm. I know that sounds strange. I mean, my husband's an athlete. Mm-hmm. Same, same issue. Same thing he works through. Wow. I'm not a huge fan of sports, but I do watch a lot of sports documentaries Mm -hmm. with my husband. We just watched one about Derek Jeter, the baseball player and same issue, like same control anxiety. So Michael Jordan, I just feel like all of these guys, same thing. So it has to be, there's some sort of athlete thing there, but that's just the comment. That's good. Um, With anxiety, like the anxiety I've experienced Mm -hmm. comes from lack of control. If I feel like I'm in control of a situation and I am in control of everybody in the room and the decisions they're going to make and the thoughts they're going to have, I feel at Mm -hmm. peace, even though there's nobody in the planet except for Jesus who has that type of control. Um, But if I have the illusion of control, I feel a lot better. Would you say that that was similar for you and wanting to, did, did your anxiety stem Mm. from wanting to be in control of every situation and outcome? Um, or was it more fear-based of the future of the unknown or both? Man, she asks questions like you, but that's great. Uh, (laughs) man, I'm like self-reflecting as you're talking Uh, to be quite honest. Like I've been really anxious about today, mm, right? mm. I want to do my best for you guys. I want to help you out and I want to represent well, and some of that is control, right? We mm-hmm. we yeah. want to make sure that we are projected and um but I don't think that comes from a negative motivation all the time. Right. Um so what so what I've so I'd say yeah. Yeah, I think control and anxiety are absolutely connected. Mm-hmm. But maybe in different ways because really uh, what I what I've been what I've been taught is is Anxiety, usually we get in the grips of anxiety when we're not getting something we think we need. Mm. So, but we don't necessarily need that. We think we need that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a broken pattern. Mm -hmm. So I think I need control. Yeah, I absolutely have those moments, but Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to control you guys right now. And and so um, I trust you. Mm -hmm. I trust you. But Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the anxiety doesn't sit next to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I trust that God's doing things in our church that we're not manipulating. Mm. It is incredible the amount of mm-hmm. stories are happening, but but doesn't mean I don't get anxious that he might take that away. Mm. Oh, right, mm-hmm. and yeah. so so there yeah. are there are constantly things where I am very clear I'm not in control, right. but you still have to sit with it. Right. So, what yeah. happens as a leader 
you're leading uh-huh. all of these people. Yeah. Um, when your anxiety or control or whatever you want to call sure. it gets the best of you, mm-hmm. what happens? They, they remind me. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've been, uh, uh, so I've, uh, man, what happens is, is, uh, I'm trying to think about how we know this out. I'm trying to think about how I'm trying to answer that question. All right. Yeah. So, so what happens is God still moves, mm. crazy things happen mm. and I can ignore how I got there and wow. the shrapnel is going to happen on the other end. Mm. Or I can be paying attention to what God's doing in me while he's still working. Mm-hmm. Right. Or things cannot happen. And so ultimately the ends don't justify how we got there. And mm-hmm. so that was one of the things I had to disassociate with. Like I had a great question asked of me, I'm sitting in things that are working and a counselor says, Hey, I think we're working on anxiety. And I told him, I was like, I don't have that. And I think you misdiagnosed it. <laughs> and then he started repeating back things I said to him. And I was like, yeah, but that's just how I lit. That, that's what got me here. Mm. Like, that's like, I, I don't, I don't want to fix that because that's, that's who I am. Mm. And this is what I do. I'm an athlete mm. or I'm a, I'm a pusher. I'm a challenger. That's what I do. And, and he had to be so gracious to me to help me see mm. by asking a question. He's like, okay, do you want to keep living that way? Yeah. Mm. Because mm. what you're experiencing in goodness is n- it can still happen even if you're not doing it the right way. Wow. And also your motivation is not going to go away. That's who you are. Your anxiety is not who you are. Your motivation is like you are driven. Yeah. You don't have to be driven in the way that comes out of your fear of what if God stops using his hand? What if I'm not found out? What if I'm found out that I'm not good enough? What if I don't have a plan for the right moment? And yeah. and so it was a self-discovery process. And, and we all have our thing, right? So we're locked into anxiety because that's me and you, Sophia, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where we've discovered. I, I think to get out of survival mode for so many people, you you have to be doing the internal self-awareness work mm-hmm. that will take you a decade. Mm-hmm. And it's not, I'm done with that, I read Eldridge's new book about it. I got it. We're just moving on. It's like, it yeah. is, ugh, man, I could go forever on this one. But Brett, I know you're a really good dad. Like mm-hmm. I've watched you love your family. Have you told Jax all the ways that he could die in his life? Like, no, no, no. you, yeah. you're a good father. You reveal to him what he can handle. And you'll, you'll slowly tell him more as he gets his driver's yeah. license. Yeah. As he makes a cataclysmic decision as an adult, you might tell him the repercussions because yeah. you're a little wiser than him. Mm-hmm. If our God's a good father, he's not going to solve these heart issues in a week with us. Come on. He's going to be so gracious as, as we're along the way to help us come to new levels of that. And so even, you know, Sophia, you're, st- you're asking about control a little bit ago, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking... Maybe, maybe I need to hear that today. <laughs> like that's gonna be my next thing I go worry about. You know, and like great. To figure that out. I did this podcast yeah. when I'm control free. Yeah, <laughs> but that's growth mindset, yeah. right? And you guys yeah. have that. Yeah. That that's a like cool guy. Who who's gonna mm. ask me the question? I don't know. You're not my accountability partner, but man, that was a good question. Mm. I need to go. I need to go be with that one. So if Kevin, if 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 I was one of your staff members or yeah. or someone in the church, um, from like maybe six years ago. And then, yeah. and then I'm still, and then I see you now. Uh, what do I see differently in Kevin? So obviously, there's the internal work that's happening. But what would I have, what would I have seen externally mm. to point to the fact that man, there's been this transformation that's happened? What would be different? Yeah, I remember my, like my first day here. <laughs> we did this. <laughs> oh man, we did this event where we invited everybody over to this local sports complex called the Nook. And I was in charge of the like all church moment in my first four weeks. I was like, why did they give this to me? <laughs> and like I pulled everybody in and played this wild kidman or the student game that we were supposed to do. And I remember right before it started, I looked up and I saw all of our elders and our senior pastor and our leadership standing on the mezzanine watching this thing. <laughs> and I went to like a thousand <laughs> pressure. Right. <laughs> And Rachel had just gone to a, a wedding. And so my wife was in, she got stuck in Chicago because she took Spirit Airlines. God rest her souls. Um, and could never get back home. Um, and, and I'm doing this alone and in front of all these people. And what? I don't know if people would experience me differently on the outside that day as today. I think I was real good at masking that down okay. and channeling all that into performance. Mm-hmm. So... What you'd probably now see from me is a slower demeanor, hmm. 
Mm. And it's even earlier and not the day of the performance and thinking this all depends on me. And it, it would be, who can I bring along with me? I'm not defined by this moment. So who can I help grow with me here? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just, a, it's more of a presence, not stuck in the immediacy of survival, but it's a, it's a presence with people, presence with my, my own, Hey, I'm going to be anxious this morning at 11 o'clock. So let's, um, man, what do I need to do before I do that? Right? It's, a, it's an awareness and a self-assured like, Hey, the tools are going to work. Use the tools. Yeah. Um, but I honestly, Brett, I don't think you would experience that much on the outside. And so what my counselor told me is actually true. Like I still am incredibly driven and motivated, mm-hmm. but out of a place that's more of a full heart and less reactive to those things that get to me to a thousand, I can handle those a little bit more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it hits now. And we had another major incident last week on site here. It, it wasn't panic. I better perform. I better do this. I better get on stage. I better get this done. It's cool. What's who's the right people need to know. Yep. I'm responding. Mm-hmm. Um, let's make sure everybody knows. It doesn't have to be me. So, yeah. but I, so I do think, uh, I really do think that there's a lot of people who are going to listen, um, to your words and even the stories and like, as you're unpacking and describing internal work and they're going to just, they're mm-hmm. going to resonate. Um, you're, you're obviously not their counselor and you don't have time yeah, to, yeah, yeah. you're not having a conversation, but if you could give a couple of tools to them yeah, in a yeah. practical sense of like, Hey, the next time I sense that I'm in that place of like, what do I do? What, what, mm-hmm. uh, what's just a practical tool that you said, man, this has helped me. It may help you. Yeah. Two. So I'll give you two practical tools. One is, uh, I'll, I don't write this down, but it, when you're stuck in the grips of something, worry, whatever your thing is, whatever your shadow is there, uh, you can differentiate between what's God's job in this, what's my job in this, and what's their job in this. And where you mm. tend to blur the lines is where you're getting your, your um, the negative voice from, the anxiety, the, wow. the depression. It's like, I'm trying to do God's job for him. Of course I'm going to feel that way. Mm. Or, um, man, that's not my job. My job in care situations as a pastor is to show up and listen to where the Holy Spirit is already working and align with that in their life and urge them to follow that. Wow. If they choose not to, I don't have a Superman cape on. Yeah. That's, that's, that's not me. Did I tell them the truth with grace? Absolutely. Was I gentle and kind? Absolutely. Was I open and available? Yes, absolutely. That's my job. Mm-hmm. God's job is to convict them before I do. And God's job is to help them take the step afterwards. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. What's, yeah. what's another tool? Yeah, so a second tool I'd say is I, I'm a deep believer in having daily tactics that help lead yourself better than than you did yesterday, right? Okay. And so, mm-hmm. so um, I'm not talking about hacky stuff like Inbox Zero and other things, I, but I do, I do have a process... <laughs> Where I lead myself through my inboxes to capture in one place and to process three times every week. And and mm-hmm. that has been the backbone of my self-leadership that has taken all the things I can manage in my life and made them manageable. So I have room for the non-manageable stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what I see from so many of our young leaders, from people entering a type of job like we do in the church or in a place where they're both trying to tell themselves what they should do and then having to execute the same plan, like we're, that's knowledge work. We're a knowledge work place now in most of places in our workforce in America. And so we, we have to be both a person telling ourselves what to do and the Wednesday person has to show up when we're exhausted and still do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so having the right tactics to not live out of your inboxes, capture everything in one place, action oriented, and then having a process three times a week to know like, this is still the right thing that God's asking me to do. Yeah. So I'm a deep believer in that stuff too. And that's, and that's just been daily tactics have been so helpful. No, that's so good. Cause we, in the, at the Institute in our academic program, one of the classes in our leadership class that, that I love teaching the first unit, which is like multiple weeks is actually self-leadership mm-hmm. and self-leadership sounds really, um, can sound really awesome, but but literally the the whole the lectures and their assignments mm-hmm. are what you've been talking about, where it actually forces mm-hmm. them to go inside by yeah. going back, right? Talking about yes. what you know what what did happen in middle school and and why is that person still running your life right now, you yeah. know, and helping yeah, yeah, yeah. you or informing your decisions and how you would res- yep. respond, and yep. then they have to come up with this whole uh, this whole. Uh, assignment essentially that talks about like their worldview and their values and their, yep. their life turning points. And, and it's, and it's basically, Hey, if you want to lead others, you, just what you said, you, you have to learn to lead yourself, but rarely do we actually teach people on how to lead ourselves. We just assume that maybe is yeah. an inherent 
uh, good. practice. Mm-hmm. So I love, yeah. I'm, I'm so, for that. Yeah. And I know you and your makeup, like you love efficiency, right? And so this like, <laughs> like this is your, it's, but it's a challenge to everybody. Yeah. You, you got to find a way that works mm-hmm. for you. Cause it's, cause it's really, I have a definition for this, but I'm curious for how do you tell, how do you tell them that self-work is not selfish mm-hmm. because it feels selfish for people who want to be helpers. Um, okay, so I, I was reading John 15, so this is like hot off the press. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, John 15, Jesus says in talking to the disciples, he essentially mm-hmm. says, the only love that I'm able to give to you is because of what I've already received from the Heavenly mm-hmm. Father. Mm-hmm. So the 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 extent or the amount that I'm able to give to you as my disciples is because what I've already received from the Father. And then he looks at him and says, now go do the same. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, when I think about self-leadership and doing self-work, I, I'm still pr- like productivity and I'm still mm-hmm. thinking, okay, well, how is this going to influence? So my mindset is, the best that I have to give to other people in leadership is what I've already received, like Mm -hmm. from the father, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so the work that I'm able, another way I said this in class yesterday, I said, the kingdom of God must prevail in me before it Mm -hmm. prevails through me. Um, I can obviously open up God's word and teach something. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, listen, I, that, that's i I'm going to coin that. Okay. Uh That's not seminary. That's Waymaker Institute. Um, and it's so true because I can, someone can say it was a great message because I've, I'm a skilled, uh, communicator, or they can say I have like, there was something there because yeah, of the, he believes that message. the, the yeah. internal yeah. work, right? And so I, yeah. I'm able to actually give people something of more substance. Mm-hmm. So in that case, it's not selfish. I just know the best things I can give to others, what's already done in me. And so that's mm-hmm. that's the whole premise that we're helping, you know, our, our students, whether it's academic program, the internship program, or the residency to yeah. actually actually do. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So practically for me, like that, for me, that means... So I lead myself every week. I spend an hour and a half setting up my week every week. Wow. Mm-hmm. Of my time, which is all the one-on-one conversations I'm going to have, thinking about, God, what is there anything that, that I need to say to them and challenge them, anything I need to encourage with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Leading team meetings, that's leading myself, leading my future self by setting up what I'm going to do each day. Mm-hmm. And then it's also in the morning looking at, is this still the right things to do this Tuesday? And wow. afternoon, every day I look at my list. Now those only take like two or three minutes, right? At the end of the minute, mm-hmm. what I've realized is one of the best ways to disarm today from tonight is to look at what I did for the day and analyze it again. Like, okay, God, was I faithful? I'm like I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I respond, instead of doing all this, I did that. And that was the right thing to do. So now what I'm gonna do with all this? Mm-hmm. And I might pick one or two things I have to do tonight before tomorrow morning, but most nights it's not. I don't have to do any of it. Mm-hmm. If I really think about I'm going to get out of my, my survival of today into the future again. Say, what do, what do I want for dinner? Well, I want to be with my family. Mm-hmm. Do I have to do this tonight? No, no. So I don't have to touch this till 7 a.m. tomorrow morning yeah. right? or 9 p.m. tonight and when the kids are in bed. And so that like those basic tactics have been just as important as my counselor appointments <laughs> and putting in rhythms of how do I self-lead myself through today mm-hmm. to not just be in survival. Like we're talking about survival, like, if you don't have basic daily tactics and weekly and, and month tactics to know where you're going and you're going to get into a meeting that you're not prepared for and it's going to trigger all this like, yep. oh, I'm just trying to make it through today. Oh, I can't do dinner tonight with my friends again because I got so much work to do. It's the works problem. And we start blaming things outside of our own personal responsibility of how to lead ourselves with daily tactics. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's been the second tool that's been like super, super helpful to it's a good word. keep doing. I still do the same process I did when I sat in a kid room at English Tavern Road <laughs> when I was on staff. <laughs> oh. And so oh. I have, I have wow. 12 years of notebooks and how I've led myself. And so wow. the, it's continued to grow with responsibility mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I have this giant stack of done books that just like, man, look at God's faithfulness to me. That's cool. That's mm-hmm. so good. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, you want the last question or what? Like, what sure. are you, doing? you yeah. got it? Yeah. How, so coming from 
being a part of a smaller church and mm-hmm. leading in that capacity. Are you calling shifting. Waymaker smaller? Okay, well, when smaller. you were a, a part church. of it, smaller. When you were a part of it, probably was smaller, maybe. Oh, it definitely. Was, oh, I, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, Not yeah. right now, yeah, just yeah. back you, when you were part. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I was probably you. twelve when you were like, a part of it. Oh, so. okay. That oh, didn't oh, personally. Thank I mean, you for that's that, just, Sophia. That, that didn't mean. To, I, it was thank, just no, fact. that was awesome. That I was gonna wear a hat. You didn't see, I lost my hair already. That was so perfect. I'm sorry. I meant to be just. Don't No, the average. I mean, the average church size in our nation is, you know, fifty people. Mm-hmm. Right, it's, right. It's insane. Yeah. What we, what you guys get to be a part of, what I get to be a part of is in, is insanity. Yeah, it's yeah. not normal. No. It's, it's no. not the normal. Right, yeah. And right. we should walk with an unnormal humility because of that. Come on. Right. Yeah. So I want to ask you about that because how, how do you, and for the people listening that aren't even maybe, you know, leaders in the church, but they, you mm-hmm. know, are just soccer coaches or leaders in their workspace or leaders in their mm-hmm. home, how do you resist the urge to find identity, value, purpose, and numbers, mm-hmm. um, and in, um, I don't know, affirmation, people loving you, lifting you up, feeling like, mm-hmm. wow, I have this whole empire in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you resist the urge for that to boost anything in you? If God were to say, I want you to go leave this behind and you're gonna just lead 10 people, how would you be okay with that? Mm. And how do you encourage other people um, to be okay with that and walk in that humility? Yeah, I, I'm not answering this question. This is, this is for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you asked again, like 50 good questions there. Uh, I, I, so this, I, I want to try to make it really practical. Mm-hmm. And this is a, a part of my big journey right now mm-hmm. because I've been rewarded for things that I don't claim anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, tr- I'm, I'm learning on the fly. So, um, one of the simple ways I want to be careful. I don't say an absolute here cause this is what we're doing right now, mm-hmm. yeah. but we are constantly experimenting in our home to, to make sure we're, we're circling around that in the mm-hmm. right way. Um, people have different opinions. I might get people in trouble here, but like, I don't tell Rachel about work when I get home. Mm-hmm. That's my job. Mm-hmm. She tells me everything about home when I get home. That's our job. Mm. That's not her job and my job. Our job is to lead our home. Mm-hmm. And um, my conviction goes so deep on this because uh, I could use all the skills I have to go do a lot of other things. And But when I was an accidental pastor, I read a book called The Pastor by Eugene Peterson. Mm-hmm. And... Um, he talked about leading his church in Baltimore for 29 years. Mm-hmm. The same summer I read that book, my dad retired from the post office after 29 years. And God used that number as a sacred echo in my life to say, Kevin, if you're going to do this, you better commit to doing it so you don't get your eyes everywhere else. Wow. And so I'm, I'm 12 and a half years into local church ministry. Mm-hmm. And I want to live a life that gets to 29. Mm-hmm. And I have a personal conviction about this because our job is one of the only ones that has a mandate in scripture of disqualification. Come on. Yeah. And if I don't lead myself and I don't do this, our job at home with Rachel, I don't get to do my job anymore. Mm. And that is one of the greatest comforts to me mm. because there's an accountability to not burning out and to not burning her out mm. and to not losing them or else mm. I don't get to do God's family. Mm. So wow. talk about humility. I mean, I didn't marry this job Mm. and it all goes back in the box if I die tomorrow and I've got incredibly capable leaders ready to go. They'll take it over. So there, there is a humility to say, but today I'm here. And so it's getting my best. Mm. Uh, and I'm going to be faithful to that. Um, Mm. I heard Larry Osborne say one time that he decided as a pastor to live a life that didn't demand a sabbatical every seven years. And so I've, I've owned that as a part of my, my journey as a pastor too, mm. as a journey as a dad, a journey mm. like I, I want to live a daily life that's replenishing what I spend mm. in a weekly life that resets what we gave that doesn't <sighs> demand I need three months off or I'm not going to make it through the next season. So how, 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 what's the practical way that you do live a life where you, as if you don't have to take a sabbatical every seven, seven years, like how do you replenish yourself? <laughs> Uh, in my calendar once a month, I have a four hour block where I chase a whim 
And so I, so this probably goes back to the control thing. One of the things I learned, I've, I've created a life giving list, uh, some guidance from, from others that have helped me on this last five years. There are certain things I do activities. Uh, Brett golf would not be one of them. <laughs> I know. But, <laughs> so we're different. We're different, but coaching is one of them. When I get to leave my day and from three fifteen to five thirty in the day, I get to go kick something really hard and laugh mm-hmm. that resets me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so having, knowing the list of what, places, what people and what activities fill the bucket back up that's dumped mm-hmm. out and then making sure they're calendared. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't help me to know those things if I never actually go on a hike. Mm-hmm. And so looking again, getting out of stuck of survival right now, looking out to like, so when am I going to do that? And then, and so the next phase for us as a family is now I've discovered this helpfulness for me. Like we're trying to pick out for each of our kids. What do we see? How do they get reset? Mm-hmm. How do how does Rachel get reset? How do we get reset? How do we one on one get reset? And then make sure they're calendared. And so wow. it's it's like, man, is we're going through a leadership uh, change here at our church. Uh, so the senior pastor who's been here for thirty two or thirty five years is mm-hmm. is um, moving into a new role in November. And one of the pastors has been here for twenty years is stepping in to lead our church mm-hmm. in an incredibly healthy transition. Yeah. So we had. Um, we were at a campfire with our senior pastor and uh, we were asking David all these like wise questions. We like really prepared. We're like firing these last questions. Like, David, what do you do? And it just came down. He's like, watch your pride, care for your family, um, lead yourself. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, no, no. But like, what's the like thing you haven't told us yet? The secret right? sauce. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's so stupid basic. Mm-hmm. And we get incredibly distracted with thinking there's more. Mm-hmm. And so, Brett, honestly, it's like so much of what I haven't said today is not groundbreaking. Mm. It's maybe giving a little bit of an answer of like, these have worked for 12 years for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're going to work for the next 17 that I'm in ministry mm. if I don't get distracted from from doing the basics really, really well. Yeah. So. Well, uh, you may say they're not groundbreaking, but you have a gift to say things that translates differently yeah. than other people. Thanks, mm-hmm. And that's what you have given us today and all the listeners. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for giving of your time. I I know that you are a busy man. I know that you have a full schedule and you're leading a large group of people. And, um, yeah, thank you. I'm so honored. Not golfing helps a lot. Oh my goodness. I actually do. (laughs) You, I'm going to, I'm going to show you my calendar and you try to find the last time I I played golf. (laughs) Okay. Disc golf. I do disc golf because Hey, we bought, we bought all the boys a disc the other day. And they throw like 17 on each hole. It's so much fun, man. Mm-hmm. It's a blast. And, and when you said that, I was like, I look, looked at Casey and I said, we got to take our kids. Like we got to start this because like, I think that'll be awesome. Yeah. It. You guys are so close to these incredible stages. Yeah. If you will mm-hmm. love your kids well at two and three, they become incredible at five. Mm. There it is. So, okay. And when your youngest is. one, <laughs> when your one, when your youngest one gets to four, you've mm-hmm. hit a milestone mm. okay. that you will you will do the things that you always thought you would be doing as a family. So don't give up. Okay. Don't give up till then. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, that was just that was the what that was. Mm-hmm. That was the Marvel scene at the end of the end credits when you thought the episode <laughs> the movie was done, and then you stay, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my yes, gosh. There's more. Like parenting advice. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, No, but seriously, Kevin, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, I love you deeply. Uh, You're a good friend. And I love that we get to partner with you in ministry to Mm -hmm. build the kingdom of God. So thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. 